The International Speech Contest. As a reminder, if you use your cell phone during the break, please, please, please ensure that it is on silent, or better yet, turn it off. Once the contest has begun, the Sergeant at Arms will secure the doors. Members of the audience are asked to refrain from leaving or entering the room during the contest. After the contest, please do not leave the room until it is determined that all the ballots have been collected. I will now announce the speaking order for the International Speech Contest. Contestant number one, Brett Bean. Contestant number one, Brett Bean. Contestant number two, Anne Lawrence. Contestant number two, Anne Lawrence. Contestant number three, Mark Groves. Contestant number three, Mark Groves. Contestant number four, John Beneshek. Contestant number four, John Beneshek. Contestant number five, Dan Hickey. Contestant number five, Dan Hickey. Contestant number six, Mayur Shah. Contestant number six, Mayur Shah. We will now proceed with the International Speech Contest. There will be one minute of silence between each contestant. Timekeepers, when I advise you to do so, please signal me with the green light when one minute is up. After all contestants have spoken, the judges will be given all the time they need to complete their balance. We will now begin with the International Speech Contest. <laughs> Contestant number one, Brett Bean. I'm not much, but I'm all I can think about. I'm not much, but I'm all I can think about. Brett Bean. Mark Twain said there are no levels of vanity, only levels of ability concealing it. Mr. Toastmaster and friends, most people are not vain. But most of us do get consumed with our own lives most of the time. However, we should never get consumed with something we don't like about ourselves. Because a lack of self-acceptance causes too much self-focus. In other words, I'm not much, but I'm all I can think of. Wow, I'm really losing a lot of hair. <laughs> How many of you struggled in high school with self-acceptance? I did too. I had other problems. Staying awake in class. Girls. And girls. I met my first girlfriend in high school. She was cute. Brown hair, brown eyes, and great legs. And she played on the volleyball team. It's not obvious, but I spent a lot of time watching the volleyball team. The problem was that she was a freshman, and I was a disaster. Actually, I was a sophomore, but somehow I could not summon the courage to give her a kiss. We dated for two years, and I still had not kissed her. Now, I know what you're thinking. Even table topics contestants getting escorted out for a contest move faster than I do. I told myself before every date, I'm going to kiss her tonight. But I check it out every time. 
Seeing that I was not going to do this, my girlfriend did the unthinkable. One night, on her front porch, she turned to me and said, Brett, can we talk about something? Uh-oh. Now, I had worried for weeks that she was going to break up with me. So as bravely as I could, I said, what would you like to talk about? Come closer. I don't want my parents to hear. Oh boy, this is bad. So I moved closer, and she moved closer, and then she did it. That's right. She kissed me. Oh, it gets worse. I was so embarrassed by my lack of courage, I broke up with her. <laughs> so let's pause just for a moment, because I'm sure you recognize that I struggled with self-acceptance, and there, it was disastrous, right? But. Even tonight, many of us in this room, I'm guessing, struggle with self-acceptance. I know I do. And we should absolutely want to improve ourselves however we can, but we first have to accept ourselves just as we are. So let's do that right now. I want everyone here, on the count of three, to accept yourself just as you are. You ready? Okay, one. Two, three. Wow! Doesn't that feel great? We know it doesn't work that way. So my challenge to you is this. Mir. Actually, the first three letters. M-I-R. Which magically also spells Mir. Who knew? M-I-R stands for mind... Internalize, repeat. First, call to mind what you need to accept about yourself. And then internalize the fact that change may or may not be possible. Perhaps you need to accept something about your body or your personality or some ability you don't have. And then finally, repeat as required. So getting back to the story, how many of you love happy endings? Well, I would love to tell you that my girlfriend and I got back together, that I drove to her house, and she was waiting at the window as I stepped out of the car, and then we ran to each other, my lips way out in front of me, <laughs> but that didn't happen. No, she fell for another guy. Breaking up with her is among my worst mistakes. Not only did I miss out on a great girlfriend, but I failed to see that she agonized over her decision to kiss me. Years later, I recognized my role in this story. That I recognize my role in the story. That, sorry, that I was a jerk, right? I mean, everybody here knows. It. But if we get back to have you ever felt like so many people are looking at you and you have no idea what to do? <laughs> of course, we all get consumed with our own lives most of the time. But never, please don't ever get consumed with something you don't like about yourself. Take it from me. The only approach worthy of a great big kiss is to accept yourself just as you are. To play in the words of Mark Twain, there are no levels of self-acceptance, only levels of ability conceiving. Mr. Tosin.
And we have a minute of silence while the judges mark their ballots. Contestant number two, Anne Lawrence. Too late. Too late. Anne Lawrence. My mom is always sneaking in these little life lessons. For example, I went to visit mom, and in her living room was an enormous harp. Mom, what's this harp doing in the living room? You don't play. And I've always wanted to learn to play. I'm renting a harp. I found a teacher, and I'm taking lessons. <sighs> mom, have you looked in the mirror lately? Aren't you a little old? Isn't it a little too late for you? And learning keeps me young. I may have to work a little longer, I might have to work a little harder, but it's never too late. Fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, have you ever found yourself saying, I wish I would have learned how to, or I never learned how to? I found myself saying that this past summer and applied mom's little life lesson that it's never too late. I'm at the outdoor pool with my family. My seven-year-old daughter Natalie had been negotiating with me all summer long to jump off the diving board. Natalie, you need to prove to me you're a strong enough swimmer first. Finally, by the middle of July, she proved it. I authorized clearance for jumping off the diving board. Oh, she was so excited. She She's waiting in line. She climbs the two rungs of the ladder to the dining board, and she catches my eye and gives me a big wave. I smile back at her and give her a thumbs up. But oh, inside, oh, I got sweaty palms. My heart's palpitating. Got a queasy stomach. It brought me back to the eighth grade, to a class trip we had, to an indoor pool. <sighs> I was too embarrassed to tell my friends I didn't know how to swim. <sighs> well, through some peer pressure and stubbornness on my part, I found myself climbing the rungs of the ladder to the platform diving board. Oh, sweaty palms. Heart palpitations, queasy stomach. <sighs> but I couldn't back down. Those eighth graders can be ruthless. I made my way over to the edge of the platform. I peered over. <sighs> it wasn't the amount of space between the diving board and the water. It was the depth of the water. It's 16 feet deep, and I don't know how to swim. Oh, it's ridiculous. <sighs> I couldn't back down. I took a breath to calm myself. I took another breath and held it, held my nose, closed my eyes, and I walked off that platform, plunging into the water. Oh, I fought my way to the top. I opened my eyes a little bit too early, and then I paddled like no dog has ever paddled before, and I got myself out of that pool. Oh, I promised myself I was never, ever, ever putting my face in water. 
Well, it only took a few moments to relive that happy memory. By now, Natalie has made it to the edge of her diving board. She still has a huge grin on her face. <laughs> she takes a breath. She holds her nose. She doesn't walk off that diving board. She plunges her body into that water, making a huge splash. She makes her way to the top, and she successfully swims to the side of the pool to her cheering and adoring family. <laughs> Natalie is used to doing everything with me. Mom, that was so much fun. Jump off the diving board with me. It's great. Oh. <laughs> Natalie, I never learned how to. And there, in the back of my head, was my mom's voice with her lesson. Say it with me. It's never too late. Well, that following Saturday, I found myself in the Adult Learn to Swim program at our local park district. All the lanes are busy with these swimmers. They're doing the front crawl. They're doing the backstroke. They're doing this fancy flip turn at the end of the lane. <laughs> Not our class. Our coach, Sarah, has us in the shallow end. We're standing, we're not moving, we're bent over with our kickboards. All we're doing is practicing the arm stroke. I felt ridiculous. At the end of the lesson, Sarah said, next week, bring a pair of goggle goals. Oh, sweaty palms, heart palpitations, queasy stomach. But I showed up to the next lesson. Sarah shows us how easy it is to put your face sideways in the water, take a breath, blow out, and turn your head to the other side. Oh man, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. So, I got my goggles, and I put them on. I made sure they were tight, no chlorine burning my eyes. I take a breath to calm my nerves, just like I, what I do when I'm going to do table tap-ups. I put my face in the water, I take a breath, I blow up, and turn my head to the other side. I survived. It took two lessons to overcome my fear of putting my face in the water. Oh, from that point on, there was no stopping me. I had to work a little harder, and it took me a little longer, but I call myself a swimmer. That conversation with my mom with the heart, that was 20 years ago. My mom calls herself a harpist. How about you? When I asked if there was something that you wish you would have learned how to, or you never learned how to, what was it? Was it some artistic skill? Was it maybe a sport? Maybe it was something more intense. Maybe there's a rift that needs mending in your family an addiction to overcome. Or maybe you're working on that first kiss. <laughs> Whatever it might be, take my mom's little life lesson. Say it with me. It's never too late. Mr. Toastman. May we have one minute of silence while the judges mark their ballots. Contestant number three, Mark Rose. We'll see. We'll see. Mark Rose.
Mr. Toastmaster, my fellow Toastmasters, and most welcome guests. The phrase, we'll see, is a two-word synonym for maybe. And we'll see is, to me, it's kind of vague. It's not as promising as a maybe. And it implies that other people have to be involved in the decision-making process. Throughout my misspent youth, I heard those words a lot in response to my questions and inquiries. Asking my father if I could get uh, a new baseball glove. We'll see. Asking my parents if I could get a new bicycle. We'll see. And there was one other response I heard quite frequently, and that was no. <laughs> and now, in my adult life, it appears that my wife has mastered that response. <laughs> Can we get a new car? No. <laughs> Can we get a larger TV? No. <laughs> Can we get a puppy? No, you're allergic to dogs. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Want to go to Hawaii? We'll see. <laughs> but what my talk is really about tonight is the emotional state that's generated by the words, we'll see. And that, ladies and gentlemen, that emotional state is hope. Hope involves anticipation, expectation, desire. Hope promotes the belief in a positive outcome relative to the events and circumstances in one's life. And hope transcends simple request for a puppy or a baseball glove because hope keeps us from giving up and it motivates us to move forward. Hope is relative to individual environments. People with disease, they hope for a cure. People that are unemployed, they hope for a new opportunity. People living under oppressive governments hope for a change. And I hope I can complete this speech in the allotted time. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> One of the mentors in my life once told me that when you have desires, dreams, when you hope or pray for something, you shouldn't just sit around waiting for it to occur. You should go out and take steps for your desires, dreams, and your hopes to be realized. In other words, act as if it will happen. So action is an integral part of hope. Which is why when we work harder, when we ask the boss for a raise and the boss says, we'll see. It's why there's research centers finding cures for disease. It's why unemployed people continue to send out resumes. And it's why there are revolutions in countries under oppressive governments. Many of the most important political and social movements of our time started with hope. I have long admired the work of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., a man who, to me, is synonymous with hope and action. In fact, yesterday was the anniversary of his very untimely death. In 1986, a book was published that contained the essential writings and speeches of Dr. King. The name of the book? A Testament of Hope. And in one of those speeches, Dr. King said, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. And when you get it, feel it, while you're waiting for your hope, while you're working towards your will see to come to fruition, it's time to give hope to somebody else. Because as that old adage states, you can't keep it unless you give it away. It may not be of the magnitude of Dr. King, but it could be a simple smile, a kind word, a dollar or sharing your talents with someone that doesn't have but desperately needs a will see in their life? Could Toastmasters be involved in giving hope to others? I think it could, and Carlos referred to that in this evening's invocation. 
It might also involve being a member of a community service organization. Volunteering, helping out at your church, your mosque, your synagogue. Being part of a community fundraiser for a charity. Or simply carving out more time to be with your loved ones, your family, your friends. Sharing, giving hope to others can have an immense positive impact, not just on them, but on ourselves as well. And as I said, hope keeps us from giving up. So get out there. Give hope to others. Follow your dreams and do get your hopes up. Will your prayers be answered? Will your desires and dreams and hopes be realized? We'll see. Mr. Toastmaster. Contestant number four, John Beneshek. Great power, great responsibilities. Great power, great responsibilities. John Beneshek. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guests. great responsibilities. And that's not just a line from a Spider-Man movie. It's actually a quote from the great philosopher Voltaire. And it's just as true today as it was in the 1700s. Powerful tools such as guns and nuclear weapons can have devastating effects if placed in the wrong hands. But the most powerful tool of all is the power of communication. As my previous speaker just said today, Dr. Martin Luther King used communication skills to free African Americans from the oppression of Jim Crow laws. While on the other hand, Adolf Hitler used his communication skills to trick millions of good, hardworking Germans. He tricked them into thinking that they should hate people that they didn't know that they should kill people that they had never met, that they should support policy that was completely against their own self-interest, and to obey without question. Now, there were thousands of Germans who opposed the Nazi party, but none of them had the same communication or leadership skills as Adolf Hitler. If there had just been one German who opposed Hitler, who could have had the same communication and leadership skills as Adolf Hitler, we may have never had a World War II. I don't know for sure, but one thing I am sure of is that today, right now, there are powerful forces that are using communication skills to try and manipulate the way you think right now. There are powerful forces using communication skills to trick you into buying things you don't need. To trick you into hating people you don't know and have never met. To trick you into supporting policies that are completely against your own self-interest. 
Well, what can we do about it? Well, you can use your own communication skills to fight these forces of evil. Now, I know some of you are thinking, give me a break. How can I do this? These people are powerful. They are professional communicators. And let's face it, I didn't know Martin Luther King. Well, that may be true. But you have the potential to become the greatest speaker you can possibly be. Let me give you an example. There was a little boy by the name of Jimmy who had a severe stuttering problem. On his first day in kindergarten, all the other kids ridiculed him mercilessly, so badly that he made a vow right then and there that he would never speak again. And so he didn't. He became a mute. He never talked. He communicated with a pencil. And because of that, he became a great writer and got straight A's all through grade school, middle school. And when he got to high school, his English teacher told him, Jimmy, that poem that you wrote is one of the best I've ever heard. All you need to do to get an A in this course is to recite it in front of the class. Jimmy quickly wrote on a piece of paper, I can't talk. His teacher said, well, you can either recite your poem in front of the class, just like everybody else has done, or you can flunk the course. The choice is yours. Jimmy was devastated. There was only one thing that he was good at. There was only one thing that he could do better than anybody else, and that was getting straight A's. And nobody was going to take that away from him. So late at night, when his grandmother was asleep, he stuck into the washroom, closed the door, and began reciting his poem. And he found, to his surprise, that if he could memorize what he was saying, he could speak without stuttering. So he repeated the poem over and over, and each time he repeated it, it got better and better. And the next day in class, the teacher asked him, are you ready to recite your poem? He nodded yes and went to the front of the class. The kids in class looked at each other, perplexed. What's going on? Everybody knows that Jimmy can't talk. And then the most beautiful sound came out of his mouth. It filled the room with this beautiful bass, baritone voice. And when the last words echoes on the walls, everyone in that class, including the very same kids who had ridiculed him in kindergarten, got out of their chairs and gave him a standing ovation. With his newfound confidence, Jimmy tried out for the school play and got the lead role. He went on to college, majored in theater. After college, he became a star on Broadway and in the motion picture industry. You know him today as James Earl Jones, the voice of Darth Vader. So, if somebody who can't even talk make a living with his voice, every single one of you can become a great speaker, maybe the best speaker who ever lived. You have in your power the most powerful tool in the universe. The two atom bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki killed 200,000 people. The communication skills that caused World War II killed over 50 million people. You have the power of communications right at your fingertips, and it's your job to use it. I tell my kids, if you see garbage on the floor, you pick it up. I'm telling you today, if you hear garbage coming out of your radio, out of your television set, on the stage, it is your job to take that garbage up too. You have the power of communications, and it is your responsibility to use it. Everyone here can do that. You can do it. I can do it. We all can do it. And you need to do it. History will judge you on what you did or did not do. It's up to you. You have the power. The greatest power of them all, the power of communications. And you have the responsibility to use it because with great power comes great responsibility. Mr. Toastmaster.
May we have one minute of silence while the judges mark the balance. Contestant number five, Dan Hickey. When life throws you a curve, when life throws you a curve, Dan Hickey. Hey, it's baseball season, and I've got a fact for you. In 1867, Candy Cummings through the first curveball in baseball, and immediately it was hailed as unfair. Unfair? Of course it's unfair. Baseball, you can steal bases. That's a good thing. It's kind of unfair. It's unfair like life is unfair. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. All right. Uh, life is unfair. Um, who has dreams out here? I've got dreams. Okay, good. We've all got dreams, so this will make the speech good. Uh, Dreams are something that you should grab onto, that you should pursue with determination. Be careful, because life will sometimes throw you a curve. Kind of like uh, going over time in a speech contest. That's an inside <laughs> joke between the folks who were here last year, because I went over time. <laughs> Dignitaries, fellow Toastmasters, future Toastmasters, I come from a baseball city, in a baseball neighborhood, in a baseball family. We were Southsiders, and we loved the Chicago White Sox. And in my family, there was only one star. That's right, you ain't looking at him. <laughs> my brother Jim. Jimbo was a star from the time he was a little kid. He wanted to be in the World Series, play in the World Series. And he pursued that dream. When he was a junior in high school, that skinny kid cracked a home run. Ooh! over the left field wall of Comiskey Park and led his high school team to the city championship. In college, he had the best record in the NCAA and made All-American. So on draft day, we were waiting for the phone call. We wanted to see who would draft him. And holy cow, the Chicago White Sox draft Jim Hickey. My brother was on the White Sox. My brother is on the White Sox. My brother is on the White Sox. I was a star of the neighborhood. I loved it. So we were all excited, and he was with the White Sox for a couple years, but then life threw him a curve, and they traded him to the uh, Astros. Well, he stuck with the game he loved. He worked his way up the minor single A, double A, triple A, and when he got to triple A, his arm gave him trouble, and it became apparent that he was not going to make the majors. A dream-killing curveball. Well, the Astros management thought he had a good head on his shoulders, and they said, Jim, how about becoming a pitching coach? He thought about that for maybe two seconds and said yes, because he stuck with the game he loved. He worked his way back up, single A, double A, triple A. When he got to triple A, he said, I would love to coach the Astros. And they said, Jim, y'all ain't going to coach the Astros because y'all need major league experience, and that's a must around here. Sorry. Career-limiting curveball, right? Well, something was about to change. You see, in mid-season 2004, the highly favored Astros were under 500, and the owner was livid. He fired the manager and the entire coaching staff. He brought on a new manager, and the new manager said, give me your AAA guys. Do you remember who the AAA pitching coach was at the time? <laughs> That's right! My brother Jimbo had made the majors! My brother made the majors! My brother made the majors! That's Don Gump style, by the way. All right, so 
He was in the majors, and we were so excited, but our excitement was tempered. That was the year that my dad lost his battle to cancer. He was Jim's biggest fan. He never got to see his son in the major league uniform. That was a curveball. Well, I don't know if my dad had anything to do with it. But the Astros caught fire and began chasing the wild card. They won the wild card and went all the way to the National League playoffs. Well, he was resigned, of course. The next year, they were chasing the wild card again. And at the same time, the White Sox were the American League division leaders. And I remember thinking, wouldn't it be weird if the Astros played the White Sox in the World Series? I mean, who would I go for? And I thought, ah, when pigs fly, that's not going to happen. Well, you know what happened in 2005. They both made it. And when they did, I was afraid to go outside because if pigs could fly, that could get really messy. But now, life threw me a curveball. Uh, who do I go for, the White Sox or the Astros? You know that old saying, blood is thicker than Lake Michigan water? <laughs> that and my brother got me tickets uh, to the World Series game, so go Astros! <laughs> that felt so weird, I had to get counseling for months. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, World Series game. We got to Cellular Field, and it was just a madhouse. You walk inside the stadium, and it was just an electrified atmosphere. And I looked down on the infield, and there he is. My big brother, the guy he slept with in the bedroom, uh, pitching batting practice in the major leagues, in the World Series, in Sox Park, no less. Dream achieved, right? I was so happy for him. Well, the game was hard fought. The Sox won by one, and when they did, that scoreboard blew up like it was Chinese New Year. What an experience. I was so happy for my brother. In the end of this, my mother, who could barely afford it, got an awesome seat behind home plate to watch her son play or coach a World Series game. And I'm sure that my dad smiled from somewhere far above the nosebleed section. Hmm. In, in conclusion, I would just like to say, go for your dreams, be determined, but be flexible. Because sometimes life is going to throw you a curve. The most important thing, enjoy the game. Mr. Toastmaster. Here we have one minute of silence for the judges mark their balance. Contestant number six, Mayur Shah. Appreciate now or grieve forever. Appreciate now or grieve forever. Mayur Shah.
Contest Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and I'm a guest. Think about it. We all know we are not promised tomorrow. We're not even promised the next hour of this meeting. And yet, we take the risk of waiting for months, years, to tell that special someone how we feel about him or her. And sometimes, we wait until it's too late. With a show of hands, has anyone over here lost a loved one in the last five years? Would you agree that the loss of a loved one is the most tragic and devastating thing a person could endure? At the age of 94, my father was so healthy that sometimes when I would see him use the stairs and not hold on to the stair rail, I would panic, but then joke and say, Papa, you're so healthy, even God must be confused how to take you away. So please, don't give him a chance. Little did I know that when the time comes, the Almighty can take you away in a blink of an eye. In July of last year, my father was diagnosed with this cancerous brain tumor that came out of nowhere. The medical research only went up to 85 year olds, but the survival rates fell under 5%. And my father was 94. When the medical world shuts his doors on us, how helpless to be feel. And then turn to prayers as the only other alternative. I spent hours after work each day sitting by his hospital bed and praying to God to make him better. Unfortunately, in his inside, the cancer was silently taking over. And as I saw him deteriorate day after day, my hopes became slimmer and slimmer. Finally, when I saw his organs starting to shut down on him, my prayers for his long life seemed selfish to me. And I switched with a very heavy heart from praying for his survival to praying for his peaceful departure. On August 7th, 2012, my father took his last breath and I lost him forever. As I was so close to him, I was heartbroken, shattered, and lonely. I still remember the night of their death, when me, my brother, and two sisters were stunned and kept staring at his lifeless body in disbelief. Even after he was pronounced dead, one of my sisters kept putting her ear on his chest just to see if Papa was still breathing. With tears flowing down my own cheeks, it was difficult for me to focus through tearful eyes and tell for sure if there was a movement of chest. Finally, a doctor reconfirmed his death. Those of you who have lost a loved one, I know how empty the life becomes. Perhaps this perspective from Henry Van Dyke might comfort you the way it did to me. When a ship spreads its sails to the morning breeze and starts its journey into the blue ocean, we feel happy and admire its beauty until it slowly diminishes in size and disappears into the horizon. Though said moment, the important thing to realize is that the ship still possesses the same size and beauty and has simply gone from our sight. So while we, on this side of the horizon, feel sad that it's gone, there are others on the other side of the horizon who are shouting with enjoyment, here it comes! And that is dying. Those of us who are fortunate to still have parents, siblings, or other loved ones around. It's easy to get wrapped up with our daily lives 
or to be fighting over some past grudges. But let's take a step back and think about it. If today was the day we took our final breath, would any of this matter? Before it's too late, we need to make time today from our busy routines. Put aside any grudges and reach out to them to treasure every laugh, every cry, every hug, every kiss, or any other interactions that we may encounter with the ones we love. Since we are not promised tomorrow, I would like to walk my talk today and appreciate now. I would like to appreciate my family for their unconditional love. I would like to appreciate Toastmasters International for this opportunity. And I would like to appreciate you all for the lessons, the laughter, and the experiences that you continue to shower on me each time we meet. My fellow Toastmasters, when would you reach out to your loved ones? Thank you, Toastmasters. I'd ask that everyone please remain silent while the judges take all the time they need to complete their ballots. And they will then be collected by the ballot count.
Table Top Picks contestants to join me up here on the stage. The three -day news, please. In order that you competed, please. Contestant number one, your name, how long you've been at Toastmasters, the club you're representing, and your educational level in Toastmasters. All right, thank you. My name is Greg Sibley. I am from Park Ridge Club 381. I am a AC Silver. Uh, I've been in Toastmasters for almost uh, 10 years now. 10 years next year. No, you're good. And your bonus question. One of your hobbies is ballroom dancing. Tell us a little bit about that. I just made that up. <laughs> <laughs> You're not gonna... I'm really into harp. Is that what it is? Okay. No, actually, I do, I do, I do like ballroom dancing. So I find it very... Uh, it's a wonderful activity to get with your spouse, so we really enjoy it together. So. Perfect. Ball well, recognition of competing in the District 30 North Division Tabletop Miss Contest. I'd like to present you this certificate of participation. Thank you for competing. Thank you. Contestant number two, your name, how long you've been in Toastmasters, the club you're representing, and your Toastmasters educational level. My name is John McAvoy. I joined Toastmasters in January. I have yet to give my first speech. I found that I enjoy doing table topics. I love being here tonight and participating in this. So your bonus question. You've completed the certification course, certification course for project management professional. What is that? It's a methodology that helps you take a look at any major project and break it down into five different components that you have to initiate a project, plan it, execute it, monitor and control it, and close it. Just the way you're running this meeting tonight. I don't know about you, but that sounds like about seven international speeches. What do you think? In recognition of competing in the District 30 North Division Table Topics speech contest, I'd like to present you with this certificate of participation. Thank you. We're going to have to. Thank you. Contestant number three, your name, how long you've been in Toastmasters, the club you're representing, and your educational level. It's on. Uh, my name is Amelia Anderson. I've been with the CBS Caremark Toastmasters Club for about two years. And I have about four speeches left to go on my CC. Very nice. So you craft beer. How oh, and where can I get some? <laughs> uh, well, I do appreciate craft beer. I'm actually going on a brewery tour tomorrow at uh, the Onion Pub up in Barrington. Um, but I have brewed a couple of times. I've been uh, trying to decide what our next brew is going to be. Um, I like uh, kind of annoying my neighbors by making whole part of buildings smell like beer. So, uh, and... Just invite them over for some. In recognition of competing in the District 30 Division Table Thomas Contest, I'd like to present you with this certificate of participation. Thank you for competing. Your name, how long you've been in Toastmasters, the club you are representing, and your Toastmasters educational level. Marguerite O'Connor, a proud member of Toastmasters since 1995, currently in the Displays Toastmasters, achieved ATM B and C L. So it says here that you are a co-author of two books. Very briefly, what are they about and why should we buy them? <laughs> Thank you. You can be like my new manager. I want royalties. <laughs> we'll talk. We'll see. <laughs> this is being recorded, you know. <laughs> and we got it all. This book is called Grief Struck, and it is to help people cope with loss. 
And the second book came about because I was promoting the first book at a Toastmasters event, and a fellow Toastmaster invited me to co-author a book about change, and that is called Leading Change and Navigating Success. Thank you for that. In recognition of competing in the District 30 North Division Game of Honor Speech Contest, I'd like to present you with a certificate of participation. Thank you for competing. Your name, how long you've been at Toastmasters, the club you're representing, and your Toastmasters educational level. I'm Jim Futransky. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Oh, yes. good. I'm representing Liberty Moto Toastmasters, and my educational level is a advanced communicator, Silver. Now, I have tasted some of Jim's cooking. He's into vegan cooking. Jim, briefly, what are the benefits of vegan cooking? Well, animals really love you if you don't eat them. <laughs> and so does your body. The people who don't love you are restaurateurs and your relatives who expect turkey on Thanksgiving. <laughs> All right, that was a softball. In recognition of competing in the District 30 North Division Tabletop Speech Contest, I'd like to present you with a certificate of participation. Thank you for competing. Your name, how long you've been Toastmasters, the club you are representing, in your Toastmasters educational level. Uh, Mike McElwee, uh, I've been with Toastmasters five years. I am currently working towards my advanced communicator silver, so I guess that means advanced communicator bronze. I'm with Aeon Leadership Toastmasters, 897-901-902-108-46B. And Libra, what else did you ask? We're good. We're good, trust me. We're, we're out of time budget. Okay, so you've completed the Chicago Marathon in 2004. What do you think about when you run 26.2 miles? So, it, it's quite an experience because you're running in front of like a million people. Uh, so, for the first 10 miles, I'm thinking, everyone get out of my way, get out of my way. This is fantastic. Around mile 15 or so, you're thinking, where's the next water stop? Man, my knees are killing me. And around 20 or 21 or so, you're thinking, kill me, kill me, God, please kill me. And then around mile 24 or so, you, it's a blackout, but I'm told I finished. So. Got it. That's it. Uh, well, in recognition of competing in the District 3 North Division Table Top Speech Contest, I'd like to present you with a certificate of participation. Thank you. Number one, your name, how long you've been in Toastmasters, the club you're representing, and your Toastmasters educational level. My name, my name is Brett Bean. I'm representing UOP Toastmasters in Des Plaines. And I've been a Toastmaster for 13 years. And I'm about two, two speeches, two mentoring two members, and mentoring one club away from a DT. Very nice. So you are admitting that you have painted your entire house. What lessons can we learn from that? Do not do it. <laughs> Our house is full cedar sh shakes. So it's not just painting the trim, it was painting this wall and that wall and all the walls. And I never want to see blue again. <laughs> <laughs> in recognition of competing in the District 30 North Division International Speech Contest, I'd like to present you with a certificate of participation. Thank you for competing. <laughs> your name, how long you been in Toastmasters, the club you're representing, and your Toastmasters educational level. Ann Lawrence, I'm representing Michael McElwee's club, the Ann Hewitt Leadership 897-901-9250B club. I have achieved my competent communicator and my advanced leadership bronze. I've been Toastmasters for two years, Scorpio. That's a lot in two years. So you like to volunteer. What's your favorite volunteer activity and why? Be my, brief. Okay, my favorite volunteer activity is donating plasma. 
I'm a mom with young children. When you donate plasma, you sit in a heated chair with blankets and watch a full-length movie with nobody bothering you. <laughs> Where can I sign up? In recognition of competing in the District 30 North Division International Speech Contest, I'd like to present you with this certificate of participation. Thank you for competing. Your name, how long you Toastmasters, the club you're representing, and your Toastmasters educational level. In that sequence. Do what you want, mix it up, baby. My name is Mark Rose. I represent Toastmasters International, Speechmakers Club, 4704, quaint and scenic, Buffalo Grove, for five years. I'm working on my advanced silver. So you like international travel. What, what place in, in internationally should you go visit? You should go to China. And if you're lucky, like we did, you can also go into Tibet. The culture, the people, the scenery, Wonderful. Very nice. Maybe we'll have to do that. In recognition of competing in the District 30 North Division International Speech Contest, I'd like to present you with a certificate of participation. Thank you for competing. <laughs> your name, how long you've been in Toastmasters, the club you're representing, and your Toastmasters educational level. My name is John Benishek, and I represent Parkridge Toastmasters Club number 381. Only three numbers to remember. I love it. All right, I'm giving him two bonus questions. The first one is short. When are you shaving the beard? I am currently in a play called Oliver. I play you guessed it, Fagan. And when we have our closing night, as I'm walking off stage, I'll be shaving this off. Every day, my kids ask me, Dad, when are you going to shave off the beard? I may just keep growing it just to tip them off. <laughs> I like that answer. In recognition of competing in the District 30 North Division International Speech Contest, I'd like to present you with your certificate of participation. Thank you for competing. <laughs> your name, how long have you been a Toastmasters, the club you're representing, and your Toastmasters educational level? Dan Hickey, uh, with uh, Toastmasters 3855 All-State Speakeasies. I've been a Toastmaster since 2005 and a member of three groups. I have achieved advanced communicator bronze, working on the silver, very close to that, and competent leader. All right. So you're a boating guy. Sailboats or powerboats? Well, if you heard my humorous speech last year, um, I got the second happiest day in the bone owner's life, and I sold it. <laughs> so uh, the troubles are behind me now. That is pretty funny. Thank you for competing in the District 30 North Division International Speech Contest. I'd like to present you with a certificate of presentation. Thank you for competing. Your name, how long you've been at Toastmasters, the club you're representing, and your Toastmasters educational level. I am Mayur Shah. I'm from Liberty Motor, which is club number 918568. I've been with Toastmasters about six years and I've finished my CC and PLB. So you like to listen to music. I've been waiting to ask this question since I read your bio. What songs motivate you and why? <laughs> but you only got 30 seconds, not one or two minutes. So you want to understand the word of that song. The one that motivates me, you know, it's a, it's a Hindi Bollywood song, but uh, I think basically any song, going back to some of the other speakers that have said, any song that tells you something about uh, not quitting and keep going in life and motivates me. Sounds good to me. In recognition of competing in the District 30 North Division International Speech Contest, I'd like to present you with this certificate of participation. Thank you for competing. <laughs> One more big round of applause for all our contestants, please. Governor and her birthday girl, Ethel Gautier, to announce the winners. Ethel! Ten seconds, please. Ten seconds? Yes, you may, Tim. Speak up. Tim's going to take ten seconds and explain the big
Hold on, Tim, I apologize. It was on, it was on the agenda. Tim Bolger has an announcement. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Paul Racino, his daughter Caitlin, in assisting me in taping these contests. And Madame District Governor, we've got all eight. <laughs> show you where you can access them. These will not be made public until after the conference. Thank you very much.
so just give it to him. Just give it to him.